Hello, Be Awesome listeners. This is episode 70. I took a little bit of a hiatus. This is your host, Joshua Peach. And I got to tell you, I am one of the luckiest guys in the world because the people in my life that I've had in all different stages of my life somehow are coming back into my life thanks to Be Awesome. And this this is no exception. Um, I met our guest probably in 1987 or 1988. Most of my listeners out of 30... Well, before you were born, um, but uh, we were 12 or 13 years old, and I was invited to her house for a house party, uh, an amazing family. Her father is a doctor, uh, took care of me and relieved me from potentially being blind in 2008, and uh, Dr. Liza Toulousen is joining me, and this is the first time we've actually spoken since 1993 with words. We've talked via Facebook, but this is the first time that we're seeing and talking to each other virtually live. So welcome, Dr. Toulouse. Thank you so much. And I wish, you know, we weren't recording earlier, but like the screams of delight to be even connected back to you and see you are so real. Like I can't stop smiling. My cheeks hurt at this point. It's great to be a guest here and so proud of all the work that you've been doing nationally and in, in the local community too, Joshua. Thank you. Well, I've been, I've been smiling ear to ear on this one too myself. Um, before we start, I did share with you that uh, there's some, I guess, sad and exciting news that's, that we're connected to. I found uh, Liza's uh, year, yearbook, uh, for those of you that are listening for the first time, I was in the same grade as Liza until the 10th or 11th grade, somewhere thereabouts. And they went on to the next grade and I just stuck around wherever I was. So I spent an extra year because I loved high school so much. But one of our teachers, our chemistry teacher, uh, Ms. Schleicher, uh, is retiring on Monday. And I found out about this and uh, her daughter, Amanda, was looking to put together some videos and I said I would do it and happy to and I didn't get it out there. So. As luck would have it, I found the yearbook, and um, every year, a high school senior class dedicates their yearbook, and as I opened it, I'm like, oh my God, the class of 1993 dedicated their yearbook to Ms. Schleicher. After 35 years, she's retiring, but I'm going to read her 1993 dedication. We, the class of 1993, dedicate our yearbook to you, Ms. Schleicher. Uh, because for the past three years, you have been so dedicated to us. Your hard work and caring ways, as well as your knowledge and insight, have guided us through the good times, as well as the turbulent times. You are truly a leader to be respected, admired, and emulated. Each member of our class has been positively affected by your guidance. We thank you for being our advisor, our teacher, our friend. Ms. Schleicher, congratulations on your retirement. I hope you have a lot of fun. It's obvious you have impacted many more lives in the class of 93 and 94 um, and wish you the best and uh, hope you enjoy the package in the mail that you'll be receiving soon from uh, the Be Awesome gang. So with that. Hey, Joshua, can I say something really quick about Mitch Schleicher as well? I, you absolutely can. <laughs> So hearing you say you're a great giving her lots of thanks for impacting all these students, but what she probably has no idea about is that she really inspired me to be a teacher. And um, gosh, I'm like thinking about her for the first time since 1993 in this way. But I was a 10th grader, I think, in her class, and I was in a class with older students. And I just remember feeling so out of place. It was like a lot of like hot soccer player types that were in the class. And then I was like geeky underclassmen. I know I was by myself and she just really took the time to make me feel included and she knew I felt out of place for so many reasons and since you're familiar with the kind of work that I do I've always thought about how she made me feel I couldn't tell you anything that I learned yeah <laughs> like, I, don't even, I know you have like chemical symbols in your <laughs> logo I don't even know what they are but I don't know how she made me feel yeah and, um, she made me feel just so included. And I felt at a time where I felt so different and that inspired what I do. And I know we'll get into that a little bit, but yeah. that inspired me to be a better teacher. So Ms. Schleicher, you have not only inspired me, but you made it possible for me to impact the lives of hundreds of other kids moving yeah. forward. So well-deserved. Thank you for everything you've done in this world. That, that is amazing. Very well, uh, very well worded and put. And, uh, Glad, I mean, this timing, like I say, is one of the things that I'm lucky about because uh, I'd rather be lucky than good sometimes. And that just happened. Uh, and now I think I got out of the 
the video that I didn't do. So, so you got two for the price of one on this thing. If you watch us on YouTube, if you just listen to it, sorry, it's just audio. But uh, let's let's dig into this, Liza. Uh, you know, you and I have known each other forever. Um, like I said, I I didn't. I, it's so hard in life today to focus on every single bit and bite that goes by. And for some reason, you made a, a post about where I ate dinner. Uh, wearing yoga pants and a mask and Crocs on Saturday. And I'm like, man, I wonder what Liza's doing. I know it's got to be something powerful and impactful. And, and, and you're very intelligent. So you're, you've got to be doing something great. And I look and uh, I, I, what's, what, what can I call, what, if you had a title, you know, you're an educator, facilitator, I mean, all that. If you had a title, a special a specialty title or something, what would you call that that you would say, I am... Boom. And this is what I cover your elevator pitch. So everybody knows it. <laughs> um, the I am boom. So honestly, like there's not a lot of people who understand what I do anyway, Joshua. So <laughs> I usually tell people like I try to help people be better people. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's essentially what I do. And I do it by helping them build skills to talk about different difficult topics. But in the end, it's, it's I want people to be better. I want people to be awesome. I want yeah. people to be the best versions of themselves. And some of that is having a tough conversation with themselves about things that we maybe haven't done well or ways that we haven't been kind or ways that we haven't been a part of a good community. So um, yeah, I think the work that you and I do is really similar. Like how do we work to help people be awesome for themselves and for those around them? I think it's really similar. And, and you know, I'm, I'm kind of a, uh, broad and I think that you kind of have a broad spectrum of things but one of your real specialties is something that we're all going through a challenge with right now right which is the, the racism yeah. diversity inclusion justice I mean all of the above um, that's one of your core competencies of understanding and trying to get people not to have, just to have the difficult conversations with themselves because first and foremost I think that's what you have to do right you have to have the difficult conversation with yourself and then have the difficult conversation with your organization, your friends, your family, um, change your way of thinking, see something, say something more, you know, doing right. things like that. So let's, let's, let's dig into this. Like what, what's, what, what is racism? Like what is, what, like when you talk about, like what we hear about all these different things, right? But what's, what is, what is, it? what are people really dealing with now on both sides? Yeah, that's a great question, Joshua. So, I mean, at its most basic, when we just think about definitions, and then I'll be like, definitions are so awful, but let's just go with definition. So by definition, racism is that there's particular power or advantages based on race, right? That's essentially it. Is. And it's essentially that there has to be an aspect of prejudice and that there has to be an aspect of power. That's the definition, but let me spread it. Let me give it to you this way. So the clinical definition for cancer, and I'm like not the MD doctor, so I'm gonna mess this up left, all, <laughs> always and Sundays. But essentially it's that you have a cluster of malignant cells that multiply quickly, right? That's like the most basic definition of cancer. Mm -hmm. But I have had, I've been impacted by it. My child's been impacted by it. People in my family have been impacted by it. You probably know people who've been impacted by cancer. And like that definition is just not sufficient. Mm -hmm. It doesn't describe me holding my child at night, praying for her to live. It doesn't describe me hoping that my sister's chemotherapy is working as I hold her infant. Like, it just doesn't describe it fully. Or mm -hmm. some of our friends, when we were growing up, lost parents to cancer. It doesn't describe that. So I'm always really quick to say, well, here's the definition of racism, but mm -hmm. you and I have really different experiences about mm -hmm. it. Um, so we'll just pause there because I think, in, in essence, sometimes people hear the definition racism and they're like, nope, not doing it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> not having this conversation, not right. today. And, uh, and I just want people to remember, like, there's a story behind racism. And mm -hmm. I'm more interested in the story, Joshua, than the clinical definition. Mm -hmm. And so what's the, what, what's the story then? What, what are we? What are we talking about? Yeah, what are we talking about on the story? Yeah. Well, so I always talk about my story first. And, um, you know, I travel around the country or used to, now I do it via Zoom, mm -hmm. uh, talking with different communities. And I'm, what I mean by that is white folks, people of color, Asian people in particular in the past couple weeks, 
about what racism is and what it looks like. But it's important to know that I didn't understand what it was until I was well into adulthood. So you and I grew up in what I would describe a predominantly white town um, where back then when I think about growing up, like if you weren't some sort of Catholic, if you didn't go to Immaculate Conception or Holy Cross, <laughs> we didn't understand your other religions. Going on, right? We knew yeah. you were there. We didn't yeah. know what was going on. Right. Um, and even when I think about growing up, I mean, we had a handful of kids of color in our class. We didn't have a lot. Mm -hmm. But I didn't, I mean, I didn't talk about race growing up. It's, it, we, we didn't learn it in our school. I can't think of a single thing that we learned in class that required me to talk about race. So um, it's not that I didn't know I was different from everyone else. I very much knew that I was Asian, that I was Filipino, but I didn't have conversation about civil rights or black people or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So when I got to college, Joshua, it was like a real wake up call. Right, because I went to college with kids from all over the country, and I think it was at that point when I realized how little I had been exposed to. Now, it wasn't really anyone's fault. I don't blame my parents for moving to our suburb. I don't really blame our teachers. I don't blame my friends, but I just had to own that I actually had zero skills. I had no skills for talking about racism. And so when I got to college, I was really clumsy about it. Um, I got all the emails to, that were like, hey, come to the student of color house or come to this event. And I was like, nope, <laughs> what am I going to talk about with all of you? Like, I, I don't have anything in common. Mm -hmm. And so it took me a really long time, I would say after college, Joshua, where I even understood what racism was. And mm -hmm. it's because I started to have more friends who had experienced it firsthand. Mm -hmm. Growing up in the town that we did, I didn't have a whole lot of black friends. And so therefore I didn't have a whole lot of black friends who were pulled over for mm -hmm. being black. Or I didn't have a lot of black friends who would talk about being followed by security guards at the mall because I didn't sure. have any. So it wasn't until I started to actually hear stories mm -hmm. that unfortunately that was the time where I realized it was real. And I think that's not that uncommon of an experience. Do you think, I mean, you've traveled around the country. Yeah. Yeah, so I grew up in, uh, from 1979 to 1984, I grew up in Bridgeport. So white was actually the third minority. It was actually Hispanic, black, yeah. and then white. And that was funny, I was, I was found my, well, the yearbook, I found my kindergarten uh, class picture. And I was like one of like four of the white kids in the whole thing. And I'm like, but I never, but growing up like that, I, I, I had to actually see the picture to remember that, that that's, that's what it was like for me. And when I came to Easton, it was it was it was shell shock for me because everybody was, <laughs> as a rule. I mean, honestly, we can we can name, and the class had 189 or 100 and whatever it was. There was probably less than 15 kids that were of color or of of another race. I mean, there weren't a lot. And um, you know, but what was interesting was. We never had a lot of experience, and again, we didn't have a lot of discussions growing up about it. Um, but what was interesting was that, that there wasn't a lot of the, there wasn't a lot of this going around. It didn't seem like when we were growing up. Like it almost seemed like there didn't need to be that talk because there didn't seem to be this this anger and this this all of this strife going on. Like I said, you know, I can remember the the, the Rodney King riots of 1992, which riots and, and protests are going to go way back, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. and the, and the Watts riots earlier before that, like th this has been going on for a long time, but I can, I've never really felt like this was something like we're seeing now. And, and it's, and it's causing a whole bunch of different emotions and thoughts where I'm thinking like, was there more racism back then? Was there something that, you know, going on that I didn't know about? And, um, I'm coming up blank, and I think that's kind of where I was listening to one of your podcasts. I'm like, I think it's called racism fatigue. Is that what? It's, is that what, there's a couple of different fatigues? Yeah. <laughs> and I was sitting there going, do I do I have some sort of fatigue just thinking about everything that's going on right now? And it is different for everybody. I can't I can't put myself in the shoes of a person of color. Um, one of my best friends, John Harris. You know, um, I, he lived across the street from me, um, and next to Ray and Amy. Um, and you know, it was like, well, we, I mean, we, we all hung out. We never really thought about any of that stuff. And we never, because of the community, we never really thought about that where you can go or not go. But when I started traveling around the country, you're hundred percent right. 
I have friends that are black and all over the country that I've gotten to meet and know and enjoy. And there have been a handful of occasions where I said, Hey, why don't we go to this, this restaurant? Oh no, that's not really right. a welcoming. Like, how do you like, it, and how do you even have that conversation? Like, what do you mean? I love that steakhouse. It's like, well, right. they really don't like it when, when people of color go there. Do you ever, do you ever notice that everybody there's white and all of a sudden you go, huh? never even thought about that like and that i think that's the one trigger in my mind yeah. that i have the hardest time with is that i think i was blind to a lot of the places that i go yeah. that have no diversity inclusion and with our oldest son we've we've pushed we we, we sent him to a private school that that's very small but it's unbelievable unbelievably diverse um because i think that's important i think you need to see that and if you don't see it then all of a sudden you ask yourself that question of like hmm where is everybody, you know, <laughs> you know, where, where are all my, where are all my friends that are different colors and different places and different languages and different things. Where are all my friends that I like that do all that stuff. So, um, right. And I think you bring up such a great point, Joshua. It's about being aware of what we saw and didn't see. And, uh, in some of my workshops, I, I use the word proximate. What are you close to? Mm -hmm. So growing up, like we were close to a certain type of economic status. I think most of our friend group was probably like middle class or so. I always thought that I was like upper middle class mm -hmm. until I went to college. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, wait, like actual teenagers drive this type of car, <laughs> like BMWs. Like yeah. I thought I was rocking hard with like my hand-me-down Volvo. I was like, yeah. oh, so wealthy right <laughs> which probably was in comparison to some of our other peers but yeah. I was rolling with like people that I went to college with who our college buildings were named after their family and I was right. like oh I guess I've never seen this kind of wealth before right? right in some ways we don't even know who we are outside of until we reach a context of something else but I'll mention this and this is something that's very close to me and you in terms of our geography so we, I would say, and I'm not black, so I don't know what some of our black peers felt at school, but I definitely grew up feeling different, right? And I think I managed well, like I still, I was in student leadership roles, I had a great friend group, but there were definitely times where I knew I wasn't white, mm -hmm. right? Like I knew I wasn't white and nobody ever made me feel horrible about it. I do remember, again, it was actually Schleicher's class where um, some of the guys were, they were talking about Asian people in a certain way. And mm -hmm. I never could figure out, and I like wanna ask them 30 years later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I don't know if they were doing that to make me feel intimidated. Mm -hmm. and I, or I don't know, Joshua, if they were doing that because they didn't see me, like right. see my personhood. Right. I have no idea. And maybe they were just like 16 year olds, right? right? Like that was the other piece. So I don't know, but I'm like, I kind of want to ask them. So you said this yeah. in like 1991 and I'm remembering it in 2020. Mm -hmm. Like that's how, that's how that stuck with me when you said this about Asian people in mm -hmm. like a chemistry class. Like, did you mean it? What was yeah. that? But I'll oh. also say this, Joshua, when you think about this growing up in Easton, how often did we go to Brockton? How often mm -hmm. were we told don't drive to Brockton, don't, don't go there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I then worked at the local college that sits on the border for, fi for almost 15 years. And very quickly, the minute first year students came to campus, they would say, I know that Shaw's is like closer to this college in Brockton. Mm -hmm. Don't go to that one. Go to the one in Easton, yeah. even though it's four miles further. Like people were really talking about those racial differences. And yeah. I think we grew up with those two in a lot of ways. We just didn't name it that way. Yeah, um, I have to turn myself in on something as you're saying this. Um, you're 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 100 right. For those of you that don't know Brockton, first of all, Brockton is an amazing city. It's known as a city of champions, not because of Rocky Marciano, not because of marvelous Marvin Hagler, not because they're state winning high school football team, uh, and also known as Shoe City. That is because they were the Shoe City capital manufacturer in the world until I think the early 80s. It's a city of champions because of the people that are there today. And, uh, and, and quite honestly, um, I, I, like I say, I'm turning myself in. All the riots and the looting and everything was happening. You and I talked a little bit before, not about this particularly, but kind of the mindset and the different people that are in part of that. And the, the, the um, Black Lives Matter protest was being held, the first one. And I, I, 
I put my hands up. I'm like, I, I was worried. I was genuinely worried. How, how bad is it going to be? How far is it going to spread? You know, what, what kind of damage is going to be done? Is this going to be Minneapolis all over again? And Amy, my fiance, uh, came in and she says, oh, uh, Ollie J. Spears is holding it. Is it Ollie J. Spears? Is that, I think I have his name right. Ollie, you know, do you know Ollie? He's in, he's a Brockton, big, big black guy. Huge. Okay. Um, he's in the, he's in the banking business, I think mortgage or, or something. And she's like, he is Brockton. Like he will speak and people will listen. And, and, and he did, he's put on a couple of wonderful protests. I think I, I told you, I put a post about the, um, the, the young, the young man that was putting the barricades back up while people yeah. were throwing fireworks. Mm -hmm. Um, but he was such a great character, but that initial knee jerk for me, yes. and I'm not saying, I don't want to say that it makes me a racist, but it made me have that feeling of like, oh crap, here comes right. this, here comes this protest. And I've seen it right. replicated everywhere else and the city's going to burn down. And the reality was there were protests. Uh, yeah. There was, there was minor looting. There was a Dunkin' Donuts that was lit on fire and the, the but it was it was a lot less than it should have been. I actually sent a, a thank you and, and and turned myself into him because you're right. Like we don't go there that often. Like who goes to Westgate Mall today? I mean, when we were little, we die to go to Jordan Marsh and Orange Julius, check out Woolworths. You know, they used to they used to sell pet monkeys there. You remember that? When we were little kids, you go there, get a hot dog, and they and they actually sold pet monkeys at Woolworths. Like we that's when we could go to Brockton. We were like four. Um, but you're you're 100 percent right. Um, and I think that comes with the optics that comes with the optics of, you know, the, the, that shift of, of percentage of the minorities. Like if you go to Bridgeport, if you're white and you go to Bridgeport today, you're going to get uncomfortable real fast. If you're an Eastern your whole life, it's going to be, it's going to be, uh, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to hit you. And, um, I think it's the optics. I absolutely think it's the news. I hate the news. Yeah. Um, the, the yeah. absolute worst thing that I've done in the last 14 days is I've been glued to the news, and and part of it is because I know all these places that, that that have had the problems, and I know the people, and it's and it's heartbreaking. But I want to see what's going on. I want to know who I need to call. Do I call this person that's in Minneapolis, or do I call the person that's in Miami? You know, are they okay? And you're checking in on people every day. But yeah, you're spot on. Like it, it like we 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 didn't go there, so we didn't get that experience, um, and we didn't have the friend base. Like if we had the friend base in Brockton, I'm sure that a uh, one town over, uh, a black student, high school student, would have had a different environment and, and impact and thinking than a black student in Easton. Um, right. So I didn't go to college. I actually did. I went to community college for three years, and I'm still a second semester freshman uh, hey. at Massasoit. So I had to go to Brockton every day for college. Um, right. Double secret probation. They won't even tell me how bad my grade is. Um. <laughs> yeah, so you make a good. So here's this other good point, and we like, you know, we're talking about in the past. We're talking about yeah. in the '90s, but honestly, Joshua, you know, I, I, I am of a certain socioeconomic status, right? Both me and my spouse both work. We take in a good income, and we always say we, as, we could have chosen anywhere to live, Joshua. To be mm -hmm. honest with you, yeah. and we chose Brockton. Yeah. We chose Brockton, and there's a couple of reasons why. Very, very specific. Now, I love Easton. My family's still there. I'm so grateful for my teachers. We started out by saying it was an Easton teacher who inspired me. I'm still very connected to lots of my peers. And I wanna say that because what I'm about to say feels critical. And what I'm offering is I did not grow up with the skills, either formally or informally, through my friend group or through my schools, for how to talk about race. I didn't grow up with the skills for how to interact with people who were very different from me. Mm -hmm. So I chose Brockton. Mm -hmm. I chose Brockton for my children to live and grow up so that they didn't have a class of 180 where there were four black classmates. Mm -hmm. I needed them to go to school where they had many black classmates, Cape Verdean, Haitian, immigrant, mm -hmm. citizen, undocumented, wealthy, not wealthy, like right. they a much more complicated story than I ever grew up with. And it took me 20, 30, 40 years to really get to this point where I think I understand it. Yeah. I just, I, I can't have that for my kids. I need them to be better prepared, better skilled than I ever was. And so my choice to live in Brockton, my choice for them to be proximate to so many different types of people 
is because I just didn't have those skills. I'm grateful for my upbringing and I wanted something different for my own kids. Yeah, and you're doing a great job. Uh, Some days. I, I, well, yeah. Well, I have to say, if you notice, uh, Liza's got a nose ring and she put a post that her daughter wanted to get a nose ring and uh, she said, why not? And they, they both got nose rings. So uh, I think that was one of the coolest stories. Like that's one of the cool mom stories. Like, hey, uh, check, check this out. You want to get a nose ring? I'll get one too then. <laughs> But uh, there's a lot of parents that listen. Uh, there's a lot of kids that listen to this podcast. Um, that's why I don't do any swear words just by chance that they, uh, that they do. Um, but, you know, what you're doing a ton. I see you're doing so many webinars and you're talking. I saw uh, Ray Ann, uh, and Amy, I think. Or there were a couple of people that posted that they, they sat in on some of your sessions this week. Um, you know, if you're a parent today you're, you're, and you're just lost, like you got a kid, I think, I think the questions I would ask your professional opinion on is um, when should parents start talking to their kids about racism is there a difference um you know if should you you know if you're if you're black should you start talking to your child when they're three or four and if you're white you know five <laughs> or six what what you know is there a difference i don't believe there is but i'm just throwing that out there because i've heard a number of different things and what is that what does that conversation look like <laughs> what would like? What would you? What, I guess give an example of what you did with yeah. your kids of time. If that's okay, I don't don't need. But just like, what do you? How how would someone take away? That's the one thing I want people to take away is they've got kids. Their kids are confused. They've been locked up for three months. And let's not forget the Asian the the Asian population in the United States had extreme <laughs> racism against them when COVID started. People wouldn't go to Chinatown or highly. Uh, highly populated areas. So we've had multiple races that have been negatively impacted right. by COVID and by the actions of the, uh, uh, that happened on May 25th with the murder that, of, uh, of George Floyd. So um, right. what, 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 would you, what would you suggest to a parent to have that conversation and when to start? Yes, I love this question. <laughs> so my first piece of advice is take a deep breath. Like, it's not, it's going to be difficult. It's not going to take you down, man. Like you've done harder things in your life than talk about race. So just take a deep breath. You're going to be fine. As long as you know, as it's okay not to have all the right answers, mm -hmm. right? Like you just take a deep breath. You're going to be okay. Mm -hmm. I think the second thing to understand is there's so many things about parenting that I still don't know how to do. <laughs> just add this to the bucket. Yeah. <laughs> things that are hard yeah. and my kids are at every stage so like my oldest is getting ready to drive oh my gosh like I, I'm having panic attacks so yeah. nobody taught me how to behave when my kid starts driving mm -hmm. like there's just some things that we do as parents that terrify the heck out of us yeah. and this is gonna be one of them and you're gonna get through it mm -hmm. but the worst thing you could do is not do it right so for my 16 year old the worst thing I could do is to never teach her how to drive right yeah. i mean it might be cheaper but yeah. like i don't want to do that eventually she's going to need to drive so i want you first as a parent to to realize that there's other things that you make decisions about in the same way so the question of when is too early i want you to remember that as a parent there's lots of things you tell your kid before they're ready mm -hmm. so even you know stranger danger like i was i was told about it when i was what like one two right. three and then as I got older, it became a little bit more scary. But the worst thing my parents could do is to not tell me how to like figure out who's who and what's what we had code words about who you could pick up. And then Uber <laughs> happened, right? Which is like, never get in a car with strangers. Now go get in a car with a stranger. So sometimes like it's hard. Those conversations change and shift. So I would say as early as possible. I mean, another conversation that you might be having as a parent is about consent and about who's allowed to touch your body. Now that feels like, I mean, even just now the tone shifted as we were talking, it's super scary. We also know it's a reality in this world that some children get hurt against their will. And we want, I wanna raise children who know how to say no. And I want adults to know not to touch children. Like there's other scary things in our world, but you better bet Joshua early on in their lives, we talked about private parts and what was not okay. So it's the same thing with race. Talking about race at an early age does not terrify your child. What it does is it gives them skills to address it. Mm -hmm. So some of us are raising children who for the first time ever 
are having a conversation about race because of what they're seeing in the news. And so this is pretty scary. But imagine if you started early. Imagine if now you're like, oh, see, we've been kind of preparing to have this conversation. It, be, it just is different. Now, if you're like, Liza, shoot, <laughs> like I just lost 17 years. Like it's also not too late, right? You just, just have to start. So I'll give people a prompt, Joshua. So one of the first conversation starters I usually give is, hey, so what are your first and earliest messages about race? Mm -hmm. Were they positive? Were they negative? I actually do a workshop, Joshua, where in real time, I say, okay, turn to your kid and child, turn to your grown up. I'm going to give you guys two minutes. Like, go ahead. Just, I'll just wait. Go ahead and have this conversation. What were your first messages? Were they positive, negative? Start, start there, right? Mm -hmm. You don't have to do some of the scary stuff for the first conversation. Build up to it. I think sometimes parents worry that they have to go hard right away. There's almost nothing that we do with kids that we just throw them into it. We are really good about, about having good conversations and thoughtful ways. Race is no different, to be honest, Joshua. And it, you know, and it shouldn't be a one and done. No. It should be an ongoing. I think that you know, one of the things that happens is things like what have happened to us over the last couple of months and we have a conversation and we say well this is this is happening because of this and we just assume that they're going to retain it and and nothing's going to change from that and that's kind of like the car analogy hey don't get in the car with strangers oh here's your uber and lyft account because they can't drive you to practice um so it's got to be it's got to be ongoing um and that's you know i think i want to get on two things i know i want to keep this kind of close on on a half an hour so we don't get people web up uh, uh webinar podcast fatigue but there's two things I really want I really want to talk about and and we can tackle whichever one you want to do first um, I want to touch on um, the diversity and inclusion lots of people yeah. are talking about it not a lot of people know what it is so the yep. def, the, the, what that is in the design and what people and organizations families should talk about and understanding what those because they're two different words they're together but they're completely different and I'm learning as I go and learning from following you now. Um, and the second thing is social media. And yeah, like I say, you can pick either of these just for the sake of time. But I really, I, I told you, I, I, I struggled with some social media posts yesterday. I've removed myself from a number of pages. I, I just feel like it was such a, a I wanted, it, it wasn't, um, fear, what is it called? Fear of missing out, FOMO. It wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't FOMO like good. Right. It was like, I wanted to make sure, I had, I've had this like, I want to make sure that people are being good to each other. Right. And when they're not all of a sudden, and I never do it. I never call anybody out. I never do like, but I, I found myself doing it yesterday. I was like, I got to get out of this. So um, diversity and inclusion and social media, I'll let you take either which, whichever way you want, whichever direction you want um, yeah. and go well, from I there. Think, I think both can be connected. So that's, what's really nice about this conversation. So again, in terms of definitions, right, I'm going to give you kind of the clinical definition and yeah. you can figure out how it fits into your life. So Joshua, you're totally right. They're two different things. They're often used in the same sentence though. So let's just talk about diversity. Diversity is just about numbers, right? So if I walk down the street and I'm like, oh, this is like a super diverse street. We got this, we got this, we got this, we got this one, right? It's just numbers, it's just categories. So I might say, okay, I'm a parent. My child's fifth grade class is like really diverse. There's lots of boys, girls, we got this, right? That's fine, but that's all that diversity is. <laughs> it's just numbers, it's just counting. So inclusion is actually what you do. It's an action. When people say they're inclusive, my next question should always be, so what do you do? Mm -hmm. right? If you say we're diverse, I don't say, so what do you do? I go, oh, tell me, tell me who's there. Mm -hmm. With inclusion, if you're gonna say, oh, I'm inclusive, my question is, so what do you do? Like, what do you mean, what do you do? So inclusion has to be their actual acts that happen so that people feel like they belong. So imagine you've got your, re you mentioned you have a child, you really diverse class, let's say. Inclusion would be everybody gets an invitation to the birthday party. Mm -hmm. Or inclusion means I gotta make sure that everybody has the right slice of cake, everybody's got a gift bag, everybody goes home. Inclusion means you're taking steps to make sure that people feel like they belong. But I'm going to give you one more though, because I actually think a lot of your listeners probably want to do more than that. And so we're going to talk about this world called equity. 
So what is equity? Well, say you're hosting your child's birthday party, lots of diverse class. Oh, who's coming? So many different types of people. Inclusion. Well, let's make sure that everybody has something to eat. Let's make sure there's enough cake. Let's make sure there's enough goodie bags. Equity is going, oh, but you know what? I know that Samantha has a peanut allergy. So let's make sure that Samantha can get treats that don't have peanuts. Oh, I also know that Johnny is gluten-free. So let's also make sure that instead of just make, having pizza, that like we actually have gluten-free pizza. So equity, I think, is actually what most of your listeners want to do, which is think about different people's needs and how can I be the best host, partner, friend, classmate, so that everybody has what they need in order to be successful. And Joshua, that does mean people get different things, right? That doesn't mean that everyone gets the same. People get different things in order to experience the same thing that you have. So those are those two, those three pieces. So here's my charge with social media. And this might make you feel better or worse, my friend. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. You might not have me please, back. Please, <laughs> please, please better. Please better. <laughs> what's so difficult is I engage in social media as part of my business. I have to know what's going on in the world. I have to see what's happening. But of course I feel fatigue. And for me, it's not just screen fatigue, like blue screen fatigue. It's I am exhausted from reading the stories of racism or hate or anger that goes around in the world. Mm -hmm. I'm also exhausted, Joshua, from reading people's comments that are like, that doesn't happen. You're making it up. Look at all these violent people. Like that's as exhausting. But here's where I'm going to kind of put out this call to action, especially to your listeners and community members who identify as white. If we're talking about racism, people of color are tired. Like we are tired and I know you're tired too, but let's acknowledge you're a different tired. Mm -hmm. So for my friends who are black, they're experiencing a really different kind of fatigue. When they watch the news, they're seeing their people. I've had so many moms call me, they're children of black boys who have said, my child is in tears because all they see is that could be their dad, that could be their uncle. And so that fatigue is very different from what I experience because when I watch the news, I don't see me. Right? I see people I care about, but I don't see me. That couldn't be me, I think. Except for when we talked about right after in the few weeks of COVID. That was me. That was my community. But here's what I'm asking white people to do. If you're feeling like, oh my gosh, Liza, I know I have to do something. I want to encourage you to actually not leave those groups. I'm actually encouraging you to be that white voice that says, hey, don't do that. That's actually not nice. I'm a white person too, and I actually think that that person of color has every right to feel that way, or I'm a white man, and I understand why black people are angry. I understand why you would want to pull out of that group. I really do. And for, if, if that is a part of your mental health, by all means, don't continue to be in there. But this is also where I, as a person of color, need white people to stay in the fight. Because if you don't, it falls back on us. It falls back on the black community. Mm -hmm. And we need you to be a part of it because I know you want to be a part of the solution. Yeah. See how much you can stay in it for the benefit of all of us, right? The kind yeah. of work that you do benefits everybody here. Yeah. Um, well, I feel better and worse, I guess, than that. I whole, know. I, uh, <laughs> yeah. you well, want? I mean, one of the things, so this wasn't, we, we literally spoke two minutes before this started. Um, we, and we talked very little bit about what, how this was going to go or the questions or anything. And, you know, one of the things that's big with me is owning what you do, owning what you say. And I'm never going to be that person that says, oh yeah, I did this, 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 and this when actually I backed out and I left. Um, and you're, you know, listening to you in the way that you put it into perspective, I'm going, yeah, I should have, I should have stuck it out. I should have stayed in that, 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 that page. I should have done, but you know what I'm going to do? I'm gonna start my own page. Yeah. Yeah. I'll start. A, <laughs> yes. I'll start a be awesome Easton page. Yes. 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 And yes. And, and it'll it'll only be it'll be yeah it'll I be more, it. it'll be more than inclusion it'll be equity. Yes. And and, and um we'll be the co moderators. Let's. Yes. I don't know. Do you know how to set up a page like that? I do. Okay. You set it up. I'll send you my logo. Let's set up a be awesome. Yay. Be awesome. We'll we'll do a be awesome. Um. We do sell sure. We'll figure that out. We'll do that after the call. We'll set something up. 
um, that's not just inclusion, it's equity. I, you know, when you were talking about that, um, you know, when we were growing up, I go back to the party that I have no idea how I was invited to. I, I don't I, remember this party. I think it was, I think it was, Char, I think it was Charlie <laughs> Turcotte. You no, know, you used to have, you, you had, I think you had a big TV down in your basement, right? I did. And, yeah. it, and it wasn't a big TV like we, like it, it was like furniture. It was like, a, right? And, and we all just hung out and watched movies. And it was like, and, and I think it was, it might have been Charlie Turcotte that got me over there. Um, that, because <laughs> it's like, I, I didn't know any of you guys. It was great. But, um, I wasn't over there because of inclusion. It was selection of who was going to be there. And I just happened to be selected with our kids today. When they're going to school, it's inclusion. Like the school opens up in kindergarten. They go, Hey, if you have a birthday party for your kid, you got to invite the whole class. And what do the parents do? I know. I'm not going to have a party. This is too, this is too much work. Hard. Yeah. I'm just going to get a chocolate and vanilla cake and then they can take the half that they like, or if they like both, they can eat the whole thing. And I love that equity that, that you talk about is, is, is the right. part of being better with people is like, hey, let me actually know, know who likes what. And there are, we've never seen so many, and here's the, here's the big one. We've never seen so many allergies in our life, right? right. If, we, if we had allergies in our, in, in our life as a kid, a parent would just throw the thing aside and just be like, forget about it. You can't eat eggs. You can't do this. You can't do that. You're lactose intolerant. Set aside. Now we've got every type of allergy, a lot of what, we put into the country of, of, of chemicals right. and all these different things have, you know, these, these, these allergies and significant. Right. We do have to be cognizant of that and not be just like brushing it off. But I think that that is an example when we think about like, right. I try to think about what's the most simplistic example that I could give someone that they could relate to that provides the importance for them to realize that diversity, it's, it's a statistic, you know, there's 39% this, 26% that, um, inclusion is, okay. and then the, the you know everybody's and in, everybody's included. The world is invited. Whatever you do, great. Whatever you like, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but the equity part, I think, is I, I would love to see um, diversity and equity. Opposed, do you see that? Right. Do you see people do a diversity and equity in companies opposed to diversity and inclusion? They'll call it DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. That's a pretty common acronym. Love it. Bingo. <laughs> Write it down. Let's let's go ahead and trademark that too while we're doing the, doing the page. Um, yeah. No, I, I think this was absolutely great. Um, I am giving you an open invitation to come back anytime to talk about oh, anything. Uh, I, I have the one thing that I have said is that in order for change to happen, it has to be ongoing. Just like talking to your kids all the time, we have to be continuing. The first keynote I ever did was for the, that I stole this from the Southern New Hampshire University president. I don't even know his name, but if he's listening, I'd been stealing this thing for like five plus years. He did a commencement speech and it was one of the greatest, uh, it was one of the greatest lines that I've ever heard. And I've tried to, in, I tried to include it in every keynote, which is talent is distributed equally. Opportunity is not. That's and right. it's important totally. for us to do that. Um, and to, to expand that. And I think that there's so much more that we can, we can be doing. So um, any last words? I mean, I, I, we, I think we covered a whole lot of bases in a low amount of time. I could talk to you all night. I mean, I, we could do this for four hours, but people would get fatigued. And, uh, yeah. I think what you're doing, I think what we're doing here right now, Joshua, is exactly what I hope we're inspiring other people to do. So you and I, this is our first conversation since like 1993, yeah. my friend. Yes. So, Take a risk, folks. Like, see, connect with old people. Have some tough conversations. This, you and I didn't prep. We just kind of went into it, right? So <laughs> be courageous about it. See yeah. what comes up. I think people in lots of loving ways will surprise you. But yeah. it takes practice. I mean, I'll just say this last piece. You've done so many keynotes. And I bet over the course of time, Joshua, you've gotten better and better and better as you've gone along. And so that's what happens with conversations about race, about parenting. We just have to keep practicing. We tweak it as we go along. Some days it's awesome. Some days it just doesn't land. And But we just keep showing up. We keep doing it. So um, I hope that people listen to this a couple of times, listen to how we interact, listen to some of the advice, some of the stories that you and I told as a way to really inspire them to do very good work out there. Thanks for the opportunity to be with you. My pleasure. We're going to set up the awesome Easton right after this this podcast and it should be up tonight okay. and that's where I'm going to put all this good stuff I think that's a, I think that's a great I think that's a great idea uh, I can't thank you enough the, the audience 
Uh, I literally sent a Facebook message, message, messenger message. I don't even, I barely even know how to do that. I am a technological idiot. <laughs> um, and I, all I said was, Liza, I would love to have you on my podcast. And I got an immediate response back. Wow. I'm so excited. Let's do this and booked it for today and had no conversations. I got an email from her at nine o'clock this morning. said, fantastic. Can't wait for today. And, and here we are. So I think yeah. the best, the best advice on all this is take a chance, talk to people, take the time to learn about people, learn about them more. And, and you know what, the best advice that you give, which I, which I failed miserably on today, um, stay in the fight, stay let people know, do it, do it with, but do it the right way. Don't let your anger and don't let your frustration and don't let hate get in the way. Um, I think you just need to keep pushing love and, and hope for folks. So, uh, Liza, Absolutely. Thank you so much. We got we got work to do. I'm 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 excited about this. We put we put work we put work in front of us uh, out of yeah. this, and it's so great to see you after all these years. So thank you so much. You too. Um, that is going to do it for this episode. This has to be one of the most powerful uh, and impactful episodes that I've done. I know I've done a lot of them, and they're all great. But this is a, a timely. I hope that you all got something out of this. This is uh, more important than ever. We need to take care of each other. We're in this, what's known as the fifth phase of the six phases of disaster, which is the disillusionment phase, which is the crash phase. This is where we have the greatest opportunity to be the worst to ourselves and the worst to others. So fight that as hard as you can. Uh, do all the best that you can. Uh, I've missed everybody. I'm going to get back to doing the regular podcast. I'm glad that this is the one to get me kicked up and going. Father's Day's coming around. I'm not talking a lot other than on the podcast. So the best thing you can do is buy a t-shirt. I got face coverings um, and I, I'm getting them no, no shipping and handling and uh, get them in time for Father's Day, depending on where you live, order by Tuesday, got a face covering and shirt special, $29.99, can't beat it. I can't believe I'm selling face coverings, but there you, there you have it. Um, but honestly, uh, I know everybody's struggling in different ways. Try to, try to make sure you take care of yourself and take care of others just a little bit a little bit more than you did yesterday and a little bit more than you do today, tomorrow. So um, if you can be anything, be awesome.